after the resettlement of many of the Cambodians and the Vietnamese in the 1980s. And it was with the arrival of the Cambodians on the boats in northwestern Australia. And from about 1989, 1990, 1991, there was a, a gradual shift in the process to making it tougher, stricter, uh, more bureaucratic, and to make it harder for people to access uh, legal remedies. And uh, this became, I think, to a bit of a head in 1992 when the government passed the legislation to make detention mandatory. It was found that the Cambodians had, in fact, been held unlawfully for a period of time in detention. Um, an offer of settlement was made of about one dollar a day, which was considered um, ridiculous at, one, at some level. But a senator, I remember, at a Senate estimates, a Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee hearing into the legislation, said to me, "Well, a dollar a day is a lot in Cambodia," and I think that was an indication that, to me, that people from overseas, the, the the refugees were considered worth less than Australian people who were already here because no one would accept a dollar a day as compensation in Australia for unlawful detention. And I think that that showed there was a political attitude that carried through uh, and was made even tougher in the Howard period. Then the focus started to shift to the Middle East with the movement of Afghans and Iraqis who were coming in in the late 90s. And then we had the Tampa and the legislation just became even stricter with the Pacific Solution. And I think that probably the, the, the worst period would have been uh, 2000 to 2002 in terms of harshness of the policy. And there was a gradual easing of the policy in about 2003, 2004, and it wasn't until the temporary protection visa was abolished in 2008 that uh, there was a significant improvement in the policy. But we can see it happening again where there's uh, emphasis from various political groups to, and politicians to try and make the policy stricter. Politically, it's easier to create fears rather than to create uh, a more pleasant and communal atmosphere. And to a certain extent, um, the political parties on both major sides have pandered to that. So I'm not sure how much of this is driven by the, the media or the, by the politicians' desire to be in the media or to get a media attention. Uh, and I think that that becomes a bit of a problem because you've got, it cre I think it creates a life of its own. Whereas if, if people just stood back from it and thought, well, what is all the fuss about? Uh, we're talking about um, a few thousand people at the most in a year in a situation coming to Australia where if they're allowed to stay, it will make very little impact on the Australian situation and won't actually change the numbers of people coming to Australia because they're part of the program anyway, and compare that with um, the sort of bigger political issues that are still floating around that we haven't dealt with, such as climate change or um, more serious issues on reconciliation, these type of things. And it, it just seems that the, it's the focus on refugees and boat people is an easy target. People who have fears about Refugees, it's more of a, a fear of the unknown and the uncertain nature of who are these people, why are they coming here, uh, why should we let them come here, uh, and what are they doing, what's happened to them, these sort of questions they don't really know. And when you can tell people some stories or introduce someone to them and let them tell their story, uh, the, the fear becomes less. Uh, and I think it's more of a fear of the unknown. And that, that I think is where uh, there has been some political traction in it is that by keeping the people's stories out of the media, by focusing on issues of sovereignty as distinct from issues of human rights, then 
it, it makes it easier to pump up the fear rather than to promote a respect for human rights and human dignity. In a sense, we're privileged to meet so many people with um, different stories and different life experiences. But most of my friends or family would not meet any of the clients. They would not have met uh, an Iraqi refugee, for example. And so I think that Eureka Street is an opportunity to present a little bit more information to get people to be, have them better read, to make them maybe be more interested in this topic, to do their own research and do some more reading on other issues. Uh, it's a the, one of the benefits of Eureka Street is it forces you to write an article very tightly, in a very short number of 600 words or something like that. So you have to be very focused and very tight on the uh, in the article. You can't um, let yourself just roll around and talk about a whole lot of other things and side issues or go into incredible detail. You have to be very precise. And I think that's one of the, the joys of Eureka Street is you can be very precise and give the information that um, hopefully will spark an interest in people. Yeah. Then I think for Eureka Street there's a number of benefits. One is it's not linked to any of the mainstream uh, large media, so it's not caught up by a need to um, present any particular political position, I think. Also, the, the advantage of Eureka Street is that um, it encourages a more uh, intellectual approach to topics rather than an emotive one, I think, which I think is uh, not, again, it's not mainstream. And uh, for those who want to have a perspective looking at uh, some religious or social justice aspect of it, that's coming through very strongly as well. And I think